Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Connecticut's Old State House. I'm Sally Whipple. I'm the executive director here, and I'm very happy to have you here for one of our conversations at noon. These are monthly programs where we uh, explore all of the people, places, events, and um, activities in Connecticut that make Connecticut wonderful and that sometimes challenge Connecticut. Um, we look at the past and we look at the present and we, um, I'm sorry, I just hit the, the button there. Um, we look at the past, we put look at the present, and today we're looking really at the present. We're looking at um, academic programs in Connecticut and the role that they play in helping students excel in school. And we are really proud to have a number of students and educated educators here, as well as Representative Haddad, to talk to us about many of the academic contests that go on throughout the state. These these are very critical contests, academic programs that really promote education and help teachers in the classroom and help students to really learn through inquiry. And we are very proud at the Old State House to be um, one of the partners in Connecticut History Day, which is part of the National History Day program. We take the lead in that program. We, we participate with a number of um, organizations across the state, including the Connecticut League of History Organizations, the Connecticut Historical Society, um, and um, a lot of different historical societies across the state to present this program. And it is one that brings a lot of heritage and history organizations together in support of students. And we're really happy to see a lot of students really digging deeply into the past, really applying what they've learned to the present. We think all of that creates good citizenship, and that is one of our missions at the Old State House. We work for history and for civic education. So today we're very happy to bring History Day together with all of these other programs, and I'm happy to say that the program today is funded by Connecticut Humanities, which is also a major supporter of History Day in Connecticut. And none of these programs could happen without the support of parents, teachers, funders, volunteers, and of course, students. So we're happy to have you here today as we explore these things. And we are going to be helped with our exploration by Diane Smith of the Connecticut Network. Diane? Thank you. Thank you, and I'm so glad you're all here today. It's great to see you. As you know, uh, this program is uh, going to be airing on CTN, the Connecticut Network, and you will also be able to get it on demand on ct-n.com. So uh, you can have all your friends watch the program. We're so glad that you came. Each year, there are thousands of Connecticut students who participate in academic contests. But what impact do these programs have on learning? Today, we're joined by students and by teachers and mentors representing History Day in Connecticut, the Connecticut Invention Convention, and Connecticut First Robotics to explain how these contests unleash creative and inspiring ways to learn about the past, about innovation, and about the future of robotics. We're going to see some samples of their work, and we're going to hear how these programs supplement and support classwork. To kick things off, we're going to be joined by someone who is a big believer in these academic contests. In fact, he sponsors one himself. He is State Representative Gregory Haddad of Mansfield, who is a board member of Connecticut Invention Convention and a History Day judge. And uh, seeing those young inventors get creative must have inspired you, uh, Representative Haddad, because he is vice chair of the Commerce Committee and has introduced legislation to spur growth in high technology industries, such as startup companies developed from university research. He has also helped secure initial funding for the planned Yukon Technology Park on the Stores campus. Please join us. Uh, well, I, I'm, I'm really pleased to be here today. And uh, first off, let me just say that I think um, that this, this series of conversations is really terrific. And I, and I thank uh, the staff here at the, uh, the old State House, including uh, Rebecca and Sally and uh, folks like Diane, who have done a great job at putting together a, a long uh, a sort of a list of conversations like these. Uh, the last one, I understand, um, was uh, they had Mark Twain was here himself. Uh, to give a, a conversation. I'm not sure I'm going to be as entertaining or as colorful as Mark Twain, but, but we'll try. Um, I am also aware that uh, you know, the students who are here today are the real stars of today's program. Um, and so I'm sure, that, uh, I'm sure we'll see exciting things from them. But again, thank you uh, for inviting me, and, and I think um, we should have an interesting conversation today. Um, 
I, my experience with academic contests are really uh, a, a viewed through my participation with four different kinds of contests in, in, in Connecticut. And I'll, I'll briefly mention the first two because we have students who have participated in, in them and, and then go into a little bit more depth than what I do in the other two. Um, the first is the Connecticut Invention Convention. And I am, uh, was first became aware of the Invention Convention because they do an annual event uh, at the state capitol. Uh, prior to being elected, um, I was a, a staffer there for a number of years and first came into contact with the Invention Convention students um, in the concourse and at the Capitol. Um, it's a great opportunity, I think, uh, uh, for students to come and, and show off what they've done to, to legislators. Um, the Invention Convention itself um, is quite um, uh, an invention, quite a, a, an event. Um, after all of the regional events, um, the, the statewide event is hosted at the University of Connecticut, which is in my district, at Gample Pavilion. This is a, a picture of the convention floor. Um, uh, statewide, about 10,000 students participate in the Invention Convention, uh, but uh, 700, and I understand that number might be going up a little this year, uh, to 800 inventors are invited to the state event and, in, uh, in stores. Um, and I've had a, the pleasure of uh, participating and seeing the energy uh, and the, ex the excitement that, um, that occurs um, at that event. Um, History Day um, is uh, something I've I'm, I'm, uh, been participating in for a number of years now as well, a few years. Um, I was uh, 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 first volunteered uh, and then volunteered myself to be a judge um, at History Day. Um, History Day is really um, a terrific event, again, sponsored by folks here at the Old State House. Um, uh, it is um, a um, an event that um, um, uh, that I think sort of the hallmark of the event is um, uh, the the variety of different opportunities that students have to be able to participate. So they we'll hear a little more about this um, from our participants. But um, I was uh, a judge for what the website division one year and also documentaries the following year. Um, they've got a lot of different ways that you can participate in History Day um, that utilize the skills that kids might already have or want to develop um, as they uh, participate. Um, I also um, am really happy to participate in that because uh, if, they, if I wear a suit jacket, they let me hand out the awards um, at, at, at Mansfield Regional Event. Um, and so there's a picture of me with a couple of students um, after they won the, uh, their awards. Um, um, I've also been very pleased to participate with um, the Civic Life Project, which is a little different. Um, it's, a, it's smaller in scope, but it aims at, at involving high school students and college students um, in understanding more about civics and government. Um, it challenges high school students uh, to do a number of things, to pick an issue. Uh, they learn filmmaking skills and produce documentaries on their issues. Um, it's, a, it's an extensive program that works over a number of uh, weeks, um, and they bring professional journalists and filmmakers together with students uh, to both teach them the skills and, of storytelling and then also give them the opportunity uh, to, to, uh, to, uh, to produce a documentary. Um, the project culminates, after they've learned how to do all their films, it culminates in a, uh, in a, um, a screening where all of the, the projects and all the documentaries for, that are produced across the street, they, the students come together um, and, uh, and show their, their finished products. And the students themselves choose uh, the best entry um, of the night. And then the last uh, um, uh, contest that I'll m just mention is uh, one that I participate and sponsor myself, as was previously mentioned. I, um, I can't take credit for this idea. Um, when I was a staffer, uh, a state senator named Bill Finch, who's now the mayor of Bridgeport, um, started a contest in his district where he asked students to write to him about uh, an idea that they thought would change the world. Uh, a policy initiative, uh, a new law. And so I've uh, continued since I've been in the State House uh, sponsoring this in my home district. So students, eighth grade students at Mansfield Middle School are invited to write to me uh, about an idea. Um, I, um, um, I, I like to, uh, to write back to each of the students because they've taken the time to tell me what they think should happen. I write back to them. I, I, um, I select the the, the best um, arguments for, for a new po piece of policy and provide those students with some citations. Um, here's me with a bunch of students getting citations. Um, and, uh, and then we take it one step further and I introduce one of the ideas as a piece of legislation at the state capitol. 
Um, and when that bill uh, moves through the public uh, hearing process, I invite those students who wrote those essays to me to come up to the state capitol um, and, uh, and testify in favor of the bill that they, that they, in, they helped to initiate. Um, a few observations about all of these kinds of uh, uh, contests, um, the common threads, I think. For, uh, one is um, our students, I think, when you go and you participate in these programs, you realize our students are really remarkable. They are bright. Uh, they are art articulate, uh, creative, and very passionate about the things that they've worked on. Um, and I, I wanted to make sure that we mentioned that at the top of the program because these are really um, um, remarkable students who participate in these uh, projects and uh, we'll, we'll get a chance to see that firsthand uh, when they come up uh, later. The events are also can be very fun. Um, whether it's History Day, um, you, know, we're, we're, you know, there's a lot of uh, judging going on. Uh, but you, you have an, I've had an opportunity to observe the, the students uh, in between, be leading both up to the time when their projects are being judged and after, uh, seeing them interact with their friends, making new friends from across the region. Um, at the invention convention, uh, what, you know, just seeing uh, a, a full floor of the Campbell Pavilion filled with young inventors who are n not just presenting their own invention but, but critiquing others, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very enjoyable experience, I think, for students, and, and they get a great sense of accomplishment um, as they uh, participate. Um, and then lastly, I'll just say, um, it's clear to me that participation itself is a reward. Um, this might not be clear to students, I think, when they first embark on this. Um, they're excited about um, uh, their projects, but, but um, this is an opportunity, I think, to, um, uh, to participate in something that's, uh, that's fun and exciting and outside of the routine of their normal educational experience. Um, and, um, and if they put in that extra effort, um, those rewards will come to those students. Um, three major points I want to make about academic contests, and the first is, um, that, um, that I think that all of them, to a certain degree, really uh, challenge students to look beyond uh, the walls of their home and their school. And maybe for the first time that's the case. Whether it's looking back at uh, history or looking forward to solving a problem that's right in front of them, uh, they have an opportunity and a, a really challenge to look um, beyond the walls of their own school. Um, uh, the Civics Life uh, Project in particular, I think, um, is a good example of that. Uh, the initial, they start off uh, with brainstorming with journalists, and this is a picture of Civic Life uh, students brainstorming with a retired journalist and really trying to hone their ideas and think about what it is that they want to, what ideas and issues they want to present, and then figure out how to, how to tell those stories over time. Um, History Day, I think, has impressed me in my, as I've judged those uh, projects in terms of um, how students are encouraged to use original research, um, not just to go to the library, but to go out and find uh, somebody that they can talk to um, about uh, the projects that they're doing, or to look for original documents um, and letters um, to help uh, shape, round out their experience. Um, at my own academic contest, again, I mean, I mentioned that um, uh, we challenge students to find a problem and offer a solution. These are the two students who, who earned uh, the great distinction last year. They came up and testified on their bill um, at the state capitol. They, their idea in this, in this instance was to, was to limit uh, parents from, or adults from smoking in cars when there are children also in their cars. Um, that's a, a longer haul in terms of a legislative accomplishment, but um, uh, the, bill, the bill has been introduced for a number of years, and there are a number of students who are interested in it. They weren't the only students to come to the Capitol and testify on the issue. Um, but they came up and they, they had an opportunity to make an impact on their world. Um, and, uh, and, I, and one of the things that I feel is really important about um, some of these uh, projects, and this one uh, f that I run, is that it helps to demystify uh, for them, uh, government and what we do at the Capitol. I mean, uh, folks, legislators almost invariably very warmly welcome students at the Capitol and um, it gives them an opportunity to understand um, how they might move forward and impact, continue to impact their world. Um, the other thing, uh, another thing I'd like to mention, sort of the flip side of that coin, which is that um, these contests are a great opportunity for members of the community to get involved in what's happening with students. Um, and so uh, at, at, um, at, at the invention convention, uh, you know, the, the, the students are being judged by uh, panels of judges, and they are folks from all different walks of life. Uh, they are certainly educators, uh, teachers and such, but also uh, college professors and deans, 
Um, they are business people who participate both as sponsors and also are involved in ac uh, a, a scientific pursuit um, in corporate research and development who come to, uh, to, um, uh, to judge. They are inventors themselves and, uh, and folks like me, like politicians and other leaders who, who get invited in uh, to participate and interact with kids. And I think almost invariably what you'll find is that judges say that one of the things that they enjoy most about participating is a, a chance to meet uh, with our, our young students. Um, the other, um, this is a, also a, a, a picture of a history day, and this shows a, a judge uh, having an in-depth conversation uh, with students. And one of the things I think that history day does really particularly well is helps uh, train judges as members of the community who are stepping into this uh, opportunity for, for ourselves uh, to offer constructive cri uh, criticism and uh, and, um, and uh, encouragement to our students. And, and after all, uh, how often do members of the community get an op have an opportunity uh, to go in and interact with our students? Um, so I think um, both of those things are really invaluable um, as we think about the value of academic contests, not just to students, but also to, uh, to the rest of us. Um, the last thing I'll mention, I'll credit Helen Shara for uh, uh, coining this phrase, Extra of extraordinary moments. Um, these are, after all, I think, for many students, the moments that they will remember for the rest of their lives as they move through their, um, through their future academic pursuits and, and on into life. Um, they are exciting, and certainly because they're contests, they, uh, uh, they're co some, somewhat competitive in nature, but they, which helps to motivate students to participate. Um, but ultimately, in the end, um, the life skills that students are learning as they present their History Day project to uh, uh, to, to judges or uh, the invention convention, um, th uh, that they are um, th that these uh, these skills that they learn are are the things that will empower them and invalidate them um, as they move forward. Um, not everybody wins, um, although many do. Um, this is a, 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 a panel discussion at the uh, at the screening for um, uh, for the Civic Life Project. Um, some students um, are not successful. Um, but they learn uh, through the process, and, uh, and I think that um, when I think about my own life, I, I remember in particular an educator who uh, handed my first college paper back to me and told me that I could do better. Um, and, and that was a moment that remembers, that I will remember, um, but it really challenged me and gave me um, the idea that not, I may not have won in that particular instance, um, but, um, but, but, but someone believed that I could do better, and that was important. So um, um, I'm going to uh, end my conversation and just uh, say thank you again um, for the opportunity to come here and to, particip to participate. Um, I look forward to hearing from the rest of the panelists and answering questions at the end if there's a chance. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK, so our first team up, Sharon Wodarsik, the National History Day Advisor for Region 15 School District, serving the towns of Southbury and Middlebury. Sharon's going to tell us more about History Day, which actually involves half a million students nationwide. And also Rebecca Hill, Rebecca, come on up, who is a student at Pomparag High School. Rebecca is a veteran of History Day competitions. And we're very proud that she won the National History Day University of Maryland Scholarship at last year's national contest. So please welcome them. Thank you. Okay, well, welcome everybody. We're delighted to be here. Um, this is actually last year at the national competition when Rebecca won, and we actually had another student that won also at the nationals last year. So in, the competition is actually um, in his, the person it's named after is the Kenneth E. Baring National History Day contest because Mr. Baring has just been so wonderful to the, um, to the program. Um, some of the, for National History Day, National History Day really encompasses what is one of the big buzzwords right now in education, the competencies. Um, students are becoming information literate, they're becoming widespread researchers, they're flexible and self-directed learners, um, they're effective communicators, and they work well in teams, commemorative, uh, collaborative team members, and they also, National History Day is really stressing to promote the global awareness um, and how the United States fits into the entire world right now. And our students are becoming so, that is something that they really need to be, um, 
they're going to be affected by the rest of their lives because our country is becoming such a global state. Um, so globally aware and active and responsible citizens is one of the goals. Um, for our program, our students start every year um, researching, and that's one of the key components of a National History Day project, is the students are researching their topics. Uh, they are, I, with my students, we generally start at the Connecticut Historical Society, and they have their first exposure to a research library. And then we also I have them participate in some kind of program that pertains to the curriculum that they are studying in their classroom. And they also get the opportunity to see what a project looks like and what a museum quality exhibit will look like. Um, for History Day, there's four elements to a History Day project that the students really need to make sure that they have in their project. One of the main things is historical context. They have to be able to place whatever topic they choose. Every year there's a theme. This year is rights and responsibilities in history. And they have to, the student will, have the choice of what they want to research. And that's one of the unique things about this program. Um, the students are the ones, it's student driven from the very beginning. So the student chooses what they want to research, they find out the historical context, they have to place it in that historical context, what the specific background is, what the causes are, the facts, who, what, when, where, and how, and the short and the long term impacts and the, the historical significance significance. Um, we also go, after that, I bring my students over to the Connecticut State Library where they are um, really exposed to what a research library is and they can find, um, we've been there and students have been able to meet authors and some very important people and it's always an exciting day when we go, but one of their favorite things is they are not used to a library like that. And whenever I say in the beginning, oh, we're going to a library on a field trip, they all kind of look at me and go, we're going to a library? And we get there and I can never get them out of there. They have so much, they really enjoy it. And I, there's one particular student I'll never forget. We lost him, we couldn't find him. He was in the stacks. And I'm trying to find him because the bus is about to leave and he comes running out of the stacks. Mrs. Wadarsik, I just found what I'm looking for. I said, that's great, but we gotta leave. You have to come back. So it's always a very exciting day. Um, and generally the students participate in different districts. We participate generally in the New Haven district. Um, and that competition, the competitions at the district level are through the month of March. And then the students move on um, to Central Connecticut State University. The end of April is when we have the state competition. And then the top two, stu top two projects in each division move on to the national competition. Um, the research confirms that students that participate in National History Day outperform their peers um, over anybody else in standardized tests, in um, Sciences, all different subjects. They are better writers with a purpose and they have a real voice. They, are, they can collaborate and talk with experts. They manage their time. They really learn time management through this program. Um, and they have a po it has a positive impact on students um, and their academic, students who might, necess might be on the verge of dropping out or um, in that, for not really engaged in education in their subjects, National History Day, because of the way it's set up, will very often engage these students and keep them in school and refocus them and redirect them. Um, students have the opportunity when they're doing a National History Day project to do either an exhibit, they can do performances, they can write a paper, a historical paper, or um, as Rebecca will, I'm going to turn it over to her, and she's going to talk about web design and also doing documentaries. Uh, so, there are two sides to examining history, facts and analysis. 
Facts are the irrefutable truths, while analysis is what, is what you draw from them. Uh, so facts without analysis it, are just meaningless, while analysis without balanced facts gives you propaganda. Thus, both are needed to balance in order to understand history, and to understand history and to be able to complete a History Day project. Uh, so I'm going to guide you through my presentation in this order. Uh, for my first fact, I began participating in the National History Day program in eighth grade. I suppose I began participating because it sounded like a really unique program. I was good at history class, but I've since learned that a uh, root memorization based history class is not at all comparable to the National History Day contest, which immerses you in an earlier world. Well, you're not just learning facts as you would in history class, you're learning the analysis as well. You're learning the viewpoints of the people who lived through the world uh, through a, a single event, whether rich or poor, democratic or republican. It's as if you had lived through the event yourself. And History Day is also unique in the number of ways it gives you to provide an argument. As Mrs. W said before, there are five different categories through which you can, pre can present a topic that you've researched and the analysis that you've drawn from it. Uh, that is website, documentary, paper, exhibit, and performance. So this brings me to my second fact. Uh, in my first two years of competing in the co contest, I created documentaries, while in my second two years, I created websites. Of the two, I'd have to say that my favorite was websites, but there are argumented, uh, there are categories to fit every personality and every person who would compete. Uh, I liked websites for the design part of things. I like to be able to set up the website aesthetically to appeal to viewers of um, my topic as I presented it. However, there are many kids I know who've done all different uh, types of categories and love them each. There is a kid in my grade who's done documentaries for four years now. His name is Nico, and he's actually going to college to be a video editor, I believe, because of what History Day has taught him, what he's learned from it, he's decided to spend the rest of his life doing something that he learned solely from the National History Day contest. So fact number three, interviews were one of the best teaching instruments of the entire experience. On the day of the competition, whether regional or state, students are interviewed by judges who view their work. And this allows them not only to learn how to speak clearly and fluently um, and to display, but it also allows them to display arguments, their arguments and their analyzing abilities in a personal setting be uh, before people who have learned their topic from them. Uh, and the judges themselves are also extremely sympathetic to the students. For instance, last year in my, when I was at the state competition, I was presenting a project uh, about the 1964 election between Barry Goldwater and Lyndon Johnson. And uh, one of my judges had spent, I don't know how long, going through her stuff to find a pin, a pin that she had gotten years and years and years before um, with Goldwater's name on it because in high school she had been a Goldwater girl. So it shows that it's not only the parents and the teachers and the educators who are interested in this, uh, in this competition and engaged in this competition, it's everyone who views it, it's the judges too. And this brings me to fact number four. Competing in the contest does take a lot of work. It's taken me hours and hours of work every year, but I'd have to say, though this may be a biased fact, the work is entirely worth it. The, this is the best program I could have chosen to compete in in high school. It's given me the research skills of a college student, the ability to create and structure arguments relying on both a balance of primary and secondary resources, to place arguments in any number of forms, to speak cl clearly and succinctly for interviews. But it's not just high school or college that National History Day has prepared me for. It's taught me to be an analytical thinker and a clear speaker, and these are skills that will carry me through the rest of my life. So uh, thank you, and I'd like to turn it back over to Mrs. W. Thank you, Rebecca.
Um, as you can tell, Rebecca really, I've had the pleasure of watching Rebecca grow and develop over the last few years, and it's been a pleasure. Um, one of the other parts, National History Day has some other fa um, components to it. Um, they do quite a bit with professional development. They're, one of the things I've really enjoyed every year that I go to the national competition is their professional development programs. They have some wonderful teacher um, workshops. And another thing they have just done the last couple of years, um, there's a, this wonderful man, Albert Small, who decided that he's a World War II veteran and he was very upset by the way our younger generation is really perceiving the war and felt that there needed to be a way for younger students to learn and to really know about World War II and the sacrifices that were made at that point. And he had this idea that he was going to hire a 747 jet and load it with a bunch of high school students and send them to Normandy. Well, luckily, when he was at that dinner saying that, Dr. Gorn happened to be there, who is the director of National History Day. And she, um, she said, we need to do something different. So they developed the Normandy Sacrifice for Freedom um, Teacher Student Institute. And let the, every year, they take 15 teacher-student pairs and they study for six months about the Normandy campaign from every aspect of it, um, from the home front to the men to women, the worldview of America, all of that is covered. Um, and I was chosen with one other student this year to, to go, and we went to Normandy at the end of it in June. Um, and one of the things the students had to do, they had to pick a soldier who was buried in the American cemetery in Normandy, research that soldier and build a website on them. And while we were at the Normandy Cemetery, um, that particular student gave a eulogy for their soldier. Um, one of the other touching things that happened is when we went to Utah Beach, the students had studied about what the soldiers had to carry and what they went through. And um, they decided we were at Utah Beach the tide was all the way out. The conditions were exactly the same as they were the morning of D-Day landing. And the, sold, the students wanted to do the run up from the water all the way to the dunes to see what it was like. And they said, we, all of them who were in very good shape, who were just in sneakers and um, very lightly dressed, um, said they don't know how these men did it. And they really, it gave them a new appreciation for what the soldiers had to go through. Um, and as I mentioned, they each gave a eulogy uh, when we got to the American Cemetery where they rubbed the grave stone of their soldier and they each gave these heartfelt eulogies that were just very, very moving. Um, my student was Tim Cohn that went and he decided to research a soldier called um, Staff Sergeant Frederick D. Smith from Waterbury and he was a part of the Second Ranger Battalions. So. One of the things that's coming out of this program also is they're trying to, in Normandy, there are over 9,000 soldiers who are buried in the Normandy Cemetery. Out of that 9,000 who are buried there and who are listed on the wall of the missing, um, they really only have information aside from dog tag information for 600 of them. So there is this campaign for students and teachers to um, honor, honor uh, fallen soldiers that they're calling the Fallen Soldier Project, where you can actually build websites and find another soldier from your area and hopefully bring their story alive so that their sacrifice is not in vain. So that is one of the things that has come out of this program. Um, and let's see, and one of the other things they did when we went to Utah Be uh, at Omaha Beach at Dog Green, the students wrote in the sand, we remember with all of their soldiers' names that they were researching. It was really a phenomenal experience and something that I'm trying to bring into some of my other students and trying to get them to have that same experience best that we can. Um, and I think we are going to have Rebecca show her documentary so you can see an example of her work. The Civil Rights Act, passed in 1964 by the United States Senate, 
gave equal rights to all African Americans, changing the treatment of 13% of America's population. Simultaneously in South Africa, Nelson Mandela was about to be sentenced to prison for life. Apartheid raged strong, and 80% of the South African population was enslaved in a system of separation, which gave them inferior jobs, education, and living standards to whites. The lack of diplomatic help from the United Nations and other countries sustained apartheid for more than 40 years. It would take the collapse of economic and educational systems within South Africa to foil apartheid. South Africa is a small country on the southernmost tip of Africa, known for the richest deposits of diamonds and other rare minerals in the world. Black labor was cheap and plentiful in the diamond industry, and white workers collectively feared that they would be fired in exchange for black African miners. Apartheid developed from the triumph of white labor unions, terrifying mine owners into unfairly limiting the rights, income, and success of black workers, which therefore ensured the whites' jobs and money. White miners rose to oversee blacks and develop a rigid social structure based on race that quickly spread across the country. Life for black Africans at the height of apartheid was strictly regulated by a series of harsh, limiting laws. The Population Registry Act separated all ethnic groups and gave each their own rights and allowances. Past laws required blacks to carry a passbook, which told police their history and access to non-black areas. The Bantu Authorities Act confined blacks to homelands, rural poverty-stricken areas where their ancestors supposedly originated, though the information was often incorrect. Travel, jobs, education, and living standards were all severely limited to black Africans. They were aliens in their own country. India raised the first complaint about apartheid in South Africa to the United Nations in 1946 because of the treatment of their own people. The issue was again raised in 1952 by the ANC defiance campaign, this time concerning race conflict in the country. Both times, the UN brushed off any accusations and agreed with South Africa that apartheid was part of the internal affairs of the country, and the UN had no reason to interfere. But in 1960, in response to the Sharpeville massacre, possibilities of South Africa acquiring nuclear capabilities, and the country's policies towards the African nations surrounding it, the UN decided that apartheid may be a threat to world peace and security. The Security Council then called for the South African government to take measures to bring about racial harmony. The government responded by, by banning the two large anti-apartheid movements in the country. I just want to say, no, Rebecca came in first place in the state with that and went on to the national competition. So. Thank you. Thank that was you. wonderful. It was really great work. Thank you so much. Uh, the next team I want to call up is the Connecticut Invention Convention team. Uh, they are a 31-year-old nonprofit organization whose mission it is to foster interest in science, technology, engineering, and math, STEM, through school-based programs in invention, innovation, and entrepreneurship. Each year, more than 10,000 students in grades K through 8 develop solutions to everyday problems. Christy Hazen has been teaching these programs for more than 10 years and is now at Two Rivers Magnet Middle School in East Hartford. And she is joined by seventh grader Connor Chin Hing to talk about his invention. Chonner, uh, Connor chose to attend Two Rivers because of the hands-on learning opportunities and the strong focus on science and emerging technology. Christy, come on up. I'd like to thank you all for inviting us to attend. This is an um, honor, and we have our um, director here and outreach director as well. I've been involved in this program for many years, um, 10 years at Two Rivers Magnet Middle School, and um, actually back in the late 80s, um, starting when the program started um, back at Talcott Mountain. So it's been around for quite a while. Um, what's really exciting about this is it's students kindergarten through eighth grade and so you have students as young as five years old who are figuring out ways to solve problems that um, are just some everyday things that they notice. So the Invention Convention, as I said, it's uh, kindergarten through eighth grade 
and um, it's going to be a way to change something, make something better, and improve it. And a lot of times um, we do something called scamper with the students, where we say, how can you substitute it? How can you combine something with it? Adapt it, make it bigger, magnify, minify. Um, can you um, eliminate something? You know, and they, then they start thinking about things and bringing in a whole bunch of stuff that they can start looking at and combining um, to get ideas from that as long, and uh, we also have the take apart where the kids take apart different kinds of electronics and see how they work and put them, well, sometimes put them back together, sometimes not. <laughs> um, so these are just some um, basic guidelines and there is a website um, which is on uh, one of the slides. Um, it's an individual project. It is not something that somebody can do with a partner and um, sometimes they say, well, I think somebody um, might have thought of this. So we say check googlepatent.com and they go on and look at the picture and say, well, it looks like somebody came up with my idea. We say, how can you change it to make it just a little bit different, a little bit better, which is uh, what we're talking about here. Um, and uh, some of the things that um, I've seen with some students is it's as simple as, you know, my mom's jewelry is getting messed up and how do I fix that? And a lot of times they're using things that they just find around the house, which is um, the cost for this. We don't let them spend more than $25, so we really encourage students to use recycled materials. Um, we say, check your garage, your basements, um, and if they say, well, I have this idea that's um, using electronics, we say, as long as you can explain the idea, um, it doesn't have to be a working model or a prototype. And they also have to keep track of um, what they're doing in their invention log, and this is really important in the judging um, process because you want to see what steps they went through. Sometimes they tested different things out. Um, also, um, they have um, their resources listed, and this is part of the judging. Um, I've done, I do judging at the state, and um, I've been working with the students kindergarten through eighth um, with their inventions, and also training the teachers um, with this. This is our um, Invention convention we had, let's see, January 23rd, so not too long ago, at Two Rivers. We had um, 200 participants, and um, that is mostly seventh graders. What we've done is we looked at the Common Core and saw that um, it really fit in nicely with the Simple Machines unit, but it doesn't have to actually be anything with a simple machine, but it was a nice um, um, way to um, out branch from that. And um, out of those 200, um, we can send 10% to the state, um, which um, Representative Haddad was talking about. And I judged there for the younger students, but that means 20 are actually eligible, and our uh, first place winner is here today. Here's um, me with seven of the 11 that went last year to the uh, state invention convention. And those students that attended, there were, I think, 11 different awards that they received there. They also have some special awards. Um, besides the blue ribbons, they have all these different sponsorships. Um, Microsoft, they have things for handicap, for safety. So um, that's, that's another part of it that students um, get the recognition. Um, this is the website, and um, there is a great little video if you ever go to that. Um, to show you exactly what it looks like and some of the students talking about it and the parents. Um, the problem solving creativity is just wonderful for these students. And there's a book that's written by Tony Wagner called The um, Creative Innovators. And it's really um, advocating that we need to get students to become more uh, creative problem solvers and get back to that whole inventive process. So I think it's time for Connor. We're going to have Connor come up here and show us his invention with the assistance of my able assistant here. We have a little bit of setting up to do. And uh, Connor is in seventh grade at Two Rivers. And as you can see, here's the panel that uh, Christy was talking about. Connor, I'm going to have you stand. I want to stand next to you so your back is not to the camera. So can you work from this side or do you need to be on that side? Can you come over here? Yeah. This side? Okay, come on over. And now first, we have to imagine this is a swimming pool, right? Yes. Okay. Can everybody see the swimming pool? Do you want to hold it up a little bit? Sure. Okay. And you're filling it with pool water? Yep. Okay. Now, tell me why 
you came up with this idea? What was the problem that you were trying to solve? Um, me and my family used to have a team, and every single time you would want to swim, uh, the pool surface would be dirty with leaves and bugs and any other collective junk, and you would have to clean it by using a very small skimmer net. Um, it would take a while, so this invention cuts down on skimming time and lets you swim more. Um, that sounds like a great idea. Yeah. I'm going to have you turn this way just a little bit. Okay, we're going to adjust the microphone here. Okay. So, tell me a little bit about your idea. You said, okay, so here's the issue. I don't want to spend so much time cleaning the pool. Um, yeah, the skimmer, it normally takes a long time to skim your pool. Uh, this invention cuts back on that and it allows you to swim and have more fun with your family and friends than you would normally. Um, it, as long as you have a friend or someone else to help you, it skims the pool in one sweep instead of having to go back and forth. Okay, so you called this invention what? The skim buddy. Skim buddy, okay. Um, tell me now what materials you used. You don't have the full-sized invention here. This is your prototype? Yes. Okay. Um, for the prototype, we used net uh, tape and uh, clothes hangers, mm -hmm. um, a plastic clothes hanger, and we cut it to size. Mm -hmm. um, and for the full size, we used uh, PVC net and tape. Um, the clothes hangers were to represent the PVC, because okay. it was the closest material we could find that was smaller. Okay, that sounds pretty good. So um, why don't you show us how this works? Um, Okay, let's turn this way so everybody can see you and the camera can see you. So this is simulating the junk on the top of the pool? Yes. Okay. There. All right, so we have some twigs and leaves and stuff that falls out of this guy. Yes? Yep. Okay, now hold up the skin buddy for a minute, show everybody what it looks like. Okay, so that almost looks like a tennis net to me, but sort of upside down. <laughs> What's a the lot material of in the middle? Um, it's insect screening. Okay. Used by landscapers. Okay. Um, and now you start at one end of the yeah, pool. Yeah, you would start a real size pool. You'd be on one side, and your buddy be on the other side. Yes, okay. and you'd both just walk. Okay. Uh, the scale model doesn't work as well as the full size does, okay. but um, it essentially cleans your entire pool, mm -hmm. and it makes it improves convenience, and um, it boosts the efficiency of uh, your output and. All that. I think that's a great idea. Are you thinking about patenting this? Yeah. Let's have you turn this way. What would you... <laughs> have you looked into what that involves? Um, not exactly. I know it's very tedious and you have to go through a lot of steps, but um, we're not there quite yet. Okay. But being an inventor can be a little tedious sometimes too, can't it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, this is a great project, and thank you very much. We're going to talk to you a little bit more. You can go back and sit over there if you like. Thank you. All right, how about Connor's project? The Skim Buddy. Okay, we're going to need to move this out of the way, Ron, I think, uh, because we have another project coming up. Our third team today actually has a name. It's First Robotics Team 181, The Birds of Prey which sounds kind of intimidating to me. Uh, First, by the way, was uh, founded by inventor Dean Kamen to inspire kids to learn about science and technology. Joining us now are the team's co-captains, Amanda Rodriguez and Janelle Smith from Hartford Public High, and they brought along their mentor, Gary Hilbert, who I think is gonna join us in a minute. Um, we might have to have the folks in the front row just move back just a little bit, and uh, why don't you come up and tell us about robotics? You don't need my help, do you? No, okay. So I'm Amanda Rodriguez. And I'm Janelle Smith. So we're a part of the first robotics team. We're part of a section called FRC, which is really a first robotics competition. Now what does FIRST stand for? FIRST stands for, for Inspiration and Recognition of Science and Technology. It, it's to inspire young, to, uh, young students from Hartford, well, from around the world, from high schools, to 
incorporate technology, science, and everyday tools into their schools. Every year, FIRST releases a game, uh, the first, week, first Saturday of this, uh, January. Our task is to build a robot in six weeks. There's no overgoing. We have to start fresh each time. Some of the games are like basketball, frisbee, and sometimes volleyball. Nothing stays the same. Each year, the game changes. So the opportunities of being a part of a first team can offer. As a member of Team 181, you do get a chance to travel. For example, um, our competitions are nationwide. So the, previously, we have went to Boston and Maine, Baltimore, and for nationals, we went to St. Louis. And FIRST does offer college scholarships. Um, for example, me, I am a senior, and I'm currently looking into the Bart Cayman Scholarship, which is a scholarship for students who want to go to college for biomedical engineering. And another opportunity is that you get to have fun. It's not just you go there and you do work, and you're just strictly doing work. You're going there with friends, and you get to have fun, goof around, because you're all doing something that you love, and you want to pursue in the future. And brings me into who can join. If you like business, you can join. It's not just building a robot. There is a section of robotics where if you're good at business, you can help us with our business plan, which I am currently doing. You put in sponsorships, anything that the team has done to raise money, the past, present, and future of the team, how you in how you intend on bringing in new members, how the team has previously brought in members. If you like art, we offer kind of like, a, I don't know, a drawing a raffle. If you like to draw, you can design our team shirts, which Gary is wearing one of our team shirts right now. And it is student made, so students do draw the, draw the design for the shirt, and it is selected by the team, and then we just get it printed onto our shirts. If you like community service, you can join our team because as a, as a first team, community outreach is a major thing in the first community. So our team, we have, did, we have volunteered to do like CPEP day and we have um, volunteered at our local Boys and Girls Club to display our robot to little children who would like to join FIRST or join robotics. Again, if you like traveling, we do travel, especially if we win regionals or this year district competitions. We do get to go to nationals, which is amazing. If you like winning, you can join because winning is, it's not everything, but it is a major thing and it is a lot of fun when you hear that your team wins because you think all the hard work we've done for the past month or month and a half has really paid off and we have made a successful robot that can perform the task. And if you like engineering, you can join. A lot of students on our team are really into the engineering and into building. We go to technology and engineering schools and robotics kind of offers everything in one, which is amazing. And who are the birds of prey? A lot of you guys are probably wondering who are, are we? Why are we here? This is our team. Well, the Birds of Prey was born, or started in 1996. So the team is roughly 17 years old, which is as old as I am. <laughs> <laughs> our main members on our team, which are high school students, come from Hartford Public High School, Pathways Academy of Technology and Design. Our two schools partner up, and our main building is at Hartford High School and the Academy of Engineering and Green Technology which is where our nest, we call it our nest because we're the birds of prey. So every meeting, the students come there and we start building our robot. Our mentors are volunteers that come from Pratt and Whitney and teachers from Hartford schools and alumni, the students that used to be on the team and graduated that decide to come back and help us out and give back to us because now they have the knowledge from going to college and they want to come back and further the team. So 
some of our achievements of what we've done. Uh, 2007, uh, we won the Philadelphia Regional, which ended up, uh, we ended up going to uh, nationals because of that. In 2012, I was honored by uh, being a part of what we call the drive team. Uh, three students, uh, two students actually, control and maneuver the robot during competitions. I was honored to be controlling as operator. So we won the Chesapeake Regional and we won uh, Connecticut State Regional. Um, something that's funny, we go to these scrimmages and we talk to the judges about how we feel about the team, how we feel about, you know, uh, first. And they awarded us the Teacher's Pet Award. <laughs> so, um, after that, we were the highest rank, which means we were at the end of each competition, you get ranked based on your performance. We were the highest rank um, out of the whole competition at Bash at the Beach. And it ended up taking us to the semifinals and championships. Unfortunately, we didn't win, but it was an amazing experience that I've had. And shortly right after that, we went to WPI, which is a college in Massachusetts, and we won the Spirit Award, which means a lot of us cheered our lungs out. We colored our hair, as you can see from my hair. <laughs> I colored my hair. Um, we did everything as possible to like, not only cheer for our team, but cheer for everyone that was out on the field. After robotics, students go on to college. Some students go on to uh, pursue careers. Most students pursue careers in engineering. Um, some students go on to uh, the military, and we should hear from them from time to time. Uh, a lot of the students do go to like to, uh, schools like Pratt and Whitney, um, not Pratt and Whitney, <laughs> sorry, um, go on to schools such as WPI, CCSU, UConn, um, ex many more schools. Um, and sometimes they do come back to mentor the team, as Janelle said, because they love being able to help reach out to young kids and show them what they learned during the time they were on the robotics team. Some of the upcoming events that we have. On February 15th, we have a scrimmage, which is actually next week, right? Yes. We have, a, we won't be, a, our new robot, which is supposed to perform a task of throwing a huge ball that's two feet uh, in Dying. diameter throw a ball to another robot and sort of assist them to make it into a goal. And that's coming up in February 15th. It's not the real competition, but it's a scrimmage. It's, suppo it's supposed to make us interact with other teams. On March, we have the Groton District, which is a real district. So we'll be performing against most of the New England District's uh, robots. And we, we are hosting currently, uh, March 29th to 30th, our own competition at Hartford Public High School. Um, it's exciting, so, yeah. And now we will display our robot from last year. The game was Ultimate Ascent, so we made a robot that can shoot Frisbees. The, t the altogether task last year was to design a robot that could shoot frisbees and climb a 10-foot pyramid. At first, we were really puzzled and confused, and we had no idea what we were doing or how we were going to be able to do this. But after one week, after sitting down with the entire team and drawing it out and planning things out, we came up with this robot, and we named her Hyacinth after one of the pyramids in Egypt. And, okay, so we're waiting for, for to connect, but yes, from the top is where we load the Frisbees and then it'll shoot out from this angle on the side. There is an angler so we can adjust the angle of the robot for there can be archer for it can shoot out straight. Um, we use a specific kind of wheels. We use mechanum wheels. They're kind of like little tubes connected in one wheel and so we could drive forward, backward, side to side, diagonally. What else? We, ha we also have um, this net in the front. It was supposed to be the thing that we used to climb our pyramid, but unfortunately it couldn't climb the pyramid successfully, so we did turn it into a net that we raise and lower 
so that we could try and block other teams from scoring into their goal, which was successful and helped so much when we were at competition because when other teams saw that we had that and other teams didn't, we were more likely to get picked so that we could be on a winning team that would be very successful in the future. Hyacinth is ready, and now Amanda will drive out our Hyacinth and show you exactly how she works. <laughs> so as you can see, this is our blocking mechanism, as I said. Right? It can be that high or you can put it back down for when we're driving, when Amanda would need to see during competition. As you saw, our wheels, they work very well when it came to driving back and forth, forward and side to side. And we will now, <laughs> we will now, okay, we will now show you how our, um, Fris how our robot can shoot frisbees, and we will dial it down all the like all the way so that nobody will get hurt. Um, thank you very much for having us here in our robot. Thank you, Janelle. Can I have the teachers come? You can leave Tyson right there if you like. I like having her out here. Can I have the teachers just join me? We'll do about a five-minute conversation. Um, Gary, will you come up, please? And uh, the other teachers, are you still here? Just come and grab a seat. And Representative Haddad, will you come and grab a seat? And we'll just talk for a couple of minutes. And if any of the students want to get in on the discussion, Janelle, you can sit right there. We can bring a microphone over to turn that off. And that was really amazing. Um, all of those displays were really fabulous. Let's give all the students a big round of applause. <laughs> Greg, I guess the question for you is, how do we get more kids and more teachers involved in these great programs? Well, I think uh, you're doing a great service by just having this program. Um, but it's incumbent on all of us who are aware of these programs to sort of spread the word. It, it is one of the reasons why we do Connecticut Invention Day at the Capitol. It's because we get some sort of notoriety that way as well. But I think um, it, it's a challenge. We can, we can reach out to, to educators through our own uh, boards of ed and, and school systems. And um, I, I think that once people learn that these concepts are there, they're, they're eager to participate. Christy, uh, you said you've been involved for a number of years. Uh, do you think that your kids are going to go on to become inventors, or are they learning something else along the way as they create their inventions? Um, some may become inventors, but I think the problem-solving skills are, are a life skill that um, the students learn. You um, try to solve a problem, you come up to some kind of thing, and so you make mistakes, and in, instead of just giving up, that they just keep, um, you know, preserve, preserve. <laughs> Continuing them on the project that they're going to persevere. Persevere, right? <laughs> <Persevere, okay. laughs> so, yeah, and I just think that this is something that's really critical for um, students to learn as young as kindergarten. Uh -huh. right. One of the uh, inventions that I saw a number of years ago was um, by a kindergartner who could not reach the cabinet to get the cookies out. So he invented a little step that would poke out of the kitchen cabinet. And he could step up on it and then climb up on the counter to get the cookies, which I thought was a pretty clever invention. Um, tell me just a little bit about History Day. This has become a very big program. Um, and yet, there are a number of students that have really never heard about it. Um, from what, what else do you want to know about here? I, I guess you know, I'm how, not quite sure. How do we question. spread the word about the great stuff that these kids are doing? I mean, I was so impressed with Rebecca's documentary. Yes. That looked pretty professional. Yes, they really are. Um, actually, National History Day is sponsored by the, um, the History Channel. Mm -hmm. And every year they have all kinds of great awards that they give to the students and all. And 
I've seen a huge growth in it. Mm -hmm. um, Connecticut now has added, I think, two new districts within the last five years mm -hmm. to our program. Um, and just publicity, you know, word of mouth, I think, has been the, a huge help for the mm -hmm. growth of the program. Mm -hmm. So I know in our, in our district, uh, the students have heard what other students have done, and especially with the Normandy situation last year, and then we had two students that did very, very well at nationals. Actually, Connecticut as a whole did very well at nationals last Definitely. year. We Definitely. really did. It was an amazing day for all of us. And we're really there. proud here at the Old State House to be the lead sponsor for Connecticut. Yes, yes. Gary Hilbert, um, you're not a teacher. You're a retired engineer from Pratt & Whitney. How'd you get involved with this? Well, I got involved uh, from a, um, a friend at work who, who was involved with the program, invited me to uh, join the team, and um, I did that about 12 years ago, and I've been doing it ever since. What have you seen the kids accomplish? Well, uh, I mean, that's the most rewarding part about uh, being involved with the program, is to watch the students mature. You know, they, they begin with us as freshmen, and to watch them mature through, uh, through the four years of high school. And then, and then to go on to college and to come back and, you know, as the girls mentioned to you, um, most of our mentors on our team now are alumni. Um, and uh, that's very rewarding to see, to see that happen. Can we bring the microphone up to the front and let's have the students um, stand up. And uh, I just want to ask you each a question. Ron, how about if you hand the microphone to Rebecca and then they can hand it down the way. Um, Rebecca, you're from History Day. Uh, what would you say is the coolest thing that you've gotten out of being a competitor and a winner at History Day? I think... And let's just let you turn around so you can look right at the camera. Perfect, perfect. Uh, probably the confidence to present my work. When I began in eighth grade, I was very intimidated by everyone else and all the other projects I've seen. But as I've gone through the competition, I've learned to uh, trust in my own ability to create uh, projects and to trust in my own skills, which I've learned through the program, the researching, uh, the argument building, the presentation, etc. All right, would you hand the microphone to Connor? Connor, tell everybody what's the coolest thing that came out of this of uh, learning that you can be an inventor? It's probably just the chance to participate and the peace of mind knowing that um, I'm able to do this, not that it's necessary, but it's it's very rewarding um, to have the chance to go to UConn and get a patent. Connor, what if you become an inventor and maybe this skin buddy will make you a million bucks? Would that be good too? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, would you hand the microphone to Amanda, please? Um, Amanda, I want you to turn your back to the camera for a minute so we can see what's on the back of your team shirt, Birds of Prey and the way you colored your hair to uh, support the team. Turn back toward the camera now and tell me, what's the best thing that you've gotten out of your time with robotics uh, first? Um, I guess the best thing I've gotten out of being a part of this team was interacting with so many people and traveling all around, you know, just traveling and being a part of this great program. I started out as a freshman, and I didn't know what career I wanted to go into. I only joined because my best friend was joining. And yeah, we, were, we did everything together, so I might as well join. Um, after joining, I met incredible mentors such as Gary and uh, another mentor called Melvin. And they sort of helped me build my confidence. And I'm able to talk to people one-on-one, -on -one, talk to judges with no fear. I'm able to uh, do presentations like this. Um, I now know what I want to become as an adult going into college. I want to pursue a career in engineering. Uh, robotic engineering, or, uh, or uh, yeah, or <laughs> just, other, like <laughs> just other careers <laughs> in engineering. Uh -huh. As a freshman, I didn't know what I wanted to do, and because of robotics, I know what I want to do now. Okay, well, you will hand the microphone to Janelle, please. Janelle, I want you to tell us about um, what you see in your future and what you think the future of robotics is. Well, in my future, I plan on going to college. And I do want to major in biomedical engineering or robotic engineering. And for the future of the team, I see a lot of us that are currently graduating, like me, coming back as mentors and helping out. Because that is something that I do want to do. I want to come back and help out my community. And there's no better way than helping out the robotics team that 
led me to where I could be in the future because that's what helped me realize what I want to be when I, when I grow up. It really taught me a lot. It taught me a lot about myself, which is something I value about the team because when I first joined, I didn't know anything about robotics. Like Amanda said, I joined because my friends were joining and it kind of sounded cool, like building a robot, but I didn't know what it entitled. And as you like pursue in the team, you develop these relationships with these people. Like, I didn't know Amanda, and now she's one of my best friends. Um, but for the future of the team, I think we're going to be very successful because you're going to have a lot of people coming back to help. All right. Thank you so much. I want to um, honor all four of you, and uh, thank you so much for being with us. And make sure you tell all your friends to watch you on television. And I want to thank all of the teachers and Representative Haddad and uh, Gary Hilbert for being a mentor. And thank you all for being here and encourage you to get the kids in your life uh, to join some of these contests that we've talked about today. <laughs>